Ida Ballard and her family, including her father, who was a Polish Jew, were hidden from the Nazis by a Christian family in the countryside of France during the Second World War. Ida married and then emigrated to the United States, settling in New York City, where she became an artist and raised a family with her third husband for more than 30 years before moving here to the North Country in 2007. She continues to paint and has teamed up with a pair of local filmmakers who are producing a documentary about her life. And this is a picture when I first came to America. Jason Greer and Vanessa Ciccarelli are working on the film that will tell the story of how Edith survived the war and then of her life as an artist in New York and the difficulty she faced when she and her husband separated because they had never legally married. They took us, they took my father, my mother, my brother and I into the countryside and the farms. And we were there for the whole time of the war. In 1943, also present among the German and French officers, were the equally recorded actors of they are. They took it upon themselves to take their two children, and leave. My grandmother did not. She stayed in the suburbs of Paris and lost her husband. He went away in the morning, never came back. As I got older, my dream was to leave France, come to the United States. And I follow my heart and I follow signs in my life. So I found a coin on the beach once when I was about 15. And it was an American half dollar or dollar, I'm not sure. And I thought this was my sign. I was going to go to America. I don't go by the rules, but I go by the righteous rules, the ones from your heart, the ones from the soul, the one that tells you you're doing the right thing in spite of the fact that it could be in the eyes of everyone the wrong thing. I'm a rebel. I do not like to follow rules in general. I am a woman. At first I was a little girl. I think I, I still am in sight. I'm hiding behind this woman. I'm an artist. My name is Dita Boulard. I'm a woman, I'm strong, and I will overcome almost anything that I'm faced with. And Ida Blard joins us now. Welcome. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you again. This documentary that Jason Greer and Vanessa Ciccarelli are producing looks at your life story. You were born in Paris in 1940 at the beginning of the Second World War. What was it like as a child being Jewish and living in France during the German occupation and the Holocaust? Um, as a very young child, we were hiding, not coming out in daytime not having toys, not having anything. Uh, we were just in a farm hiding all the time. So my feelings of that is there was fear. We could hear bombing, we could hear all of that. And fortunately for my parents, my father was a tailor and my mother was a knitter. So they were f always working they were always doing for the farmers and for us in, while we were in hiding. After the war, my parents thought they're going back to their home when the war ended, but there was nothing left. There was no place to go. And then eventually got a little place, a 
an apartment again, and then the school started. School, uh, <laughs> that's difficult. I first, I think, was in a private school, and then I went into a convent. I went with nuns from the age of seven, eight to about 10. And then I went to public school. And that's when I started to feel the effect of antisemitism, where people didn't like us. And in school, I felt that. My maiden name is very Dutch and very Jewish, Levin Crown, so in school you couldn't hide. And, and it, it, was, it was very unpleasant. I, I wanted to leave since I was a child. When the war ended and you went back to live in France, as a teenager, did you want to come to America? I found a coin on the beach. I said that before. I found a coin on, a coin on the beach from soldiers. I'm sure when they came to liberate friends. And that was my, my sign. And how did you leave? How did you end up leaving France and coming to America? I married a soldier. I married someone that I met in Paris, you know. So I, I found the best way was what I did, which married someone to take me here. And you came to New York? I came to New York, yes. When you were living in New York, tell me about life uh, in New York. You were in your 20s, uh, yes. and, and how was life living in New York? It was um, wonderful, and then, of course, my father and mother came, too, and I had a child, too, so we were together. I was here in 1961. I married again for a short time. Again, another step. And <laughs> I married the son of a baseball player famous Mabel's pair. His name was uh, uh, Eddie, Eddie Miller. They called him Epi from the Boston Red Sox, but I married the son. Okay. And the son was not the baseball player. It was not nice. So that lasted a very short time. So anyway, after that, I was going to an Israeli cafe, and my brother was visiting. I was, uh, I was going to an Israeli cafe called Cafe Tel Aviv, and I met what I thought at the time was a Yemenite, a Jewish dark-skinned person. It happened to be a Puerto Rican. So we met, and together I stay with that man for 35 years. That yeah, was Horace who you met. Yes, Horace. And Horace and I and my father went into business, built a big business together, um, a fast food business, a real estate business. Horace had quite a vision for Coney Island. Uh, yes, he and Horace was, was hopeful uh, that he would be able to save some of the landmarks yes, there and uh, create this major new attraction. Big dream, yes. And and the city was was behind it oh, yes, for a number oh, yeah. of years. Yes. Ed Koch and others they thought it was a great idea, a multi million dollar plan to yes. revive Coney Island, and then it what happened? Well, the financial world collapsed. But his dream was to have this big Coney Island, and we put a lot of time and, and years and money, and, and my father worked with Horace, too, for 15 years. Yeah. And then the city changed his mind. Rudy Giuliani came in. Yes. They were interested in, in having baseball. a minor league baseball yes. stadium there that's there now, and, and for other reasons, it sort of scuttled the whole, the whole project. Yes, but Horace couldn't bring himself to give it away. It's not that he was going to give it away totally, but they were going to take it and handle the political system, and the, they had the money behind them. They were very powerful people. He just couldn't do it. So they dismissed the whole thing because if they had gone, they could not go against the administration of Giuliani. There's no way they could have done that. And he, he was blind to that. And so what happened? He got sick. And you know, subsequently he, he passed away, and the project never happened. And then and I, f I felt so terrible myself for him, because I, you know, 35 years is a long time. And you never actually got married. He had a religion that didn't allow him to marry, 
he, he was Pentecostal, which is very religious. But his mother, who died the first year that we were together, um, approved of me. And he always told me, my mother approved of you. So I guess there was enough. But to marry, he could not because of the religion. That became a problem that you hadn't Yes, I, we didn't married. foresee that. He didn't foresee that. I'm sure he never thought about what would happen to me when he got sick and we were not married. But we have a daughter. And fortunately, she inherited 90% of the estate, which is fine. I'm OK with that. But it did destroy us. It destroyed us totally. Um, the only reason I came out with, uh, as, I, as well as I did, and it was very painful because I had to sue the man I loved most of my life, and really my adult life, 35 years is half a life. So um, I had to do something against my nature in order to survive. I had to sue him. How do you do that to the person you love? So, but anyway, I did. And now I don't want anyone else to go through that. In other states, your relationship after a number of years would have been recognized as a common law marriage. And you would have gotten many of the same rights as couples who actually got married, but not in New York State. I know. It used to be the law in New York, mm -hmm. but the legislature changed that almost a century ago. 1933. 1933. That's why I have to move fast. And a well-known <laughs> legislator at the time in Albany uh, from here in Plattsburgh yes. was behind the change. Yes, Feinberg. 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 Yep. Benjamin Feiberg. So it's not going to be hard because it's not making a new law. It's bringing an old one and reopening it again. Because that happened from two, 1902 to 1908, there was a law, and by accident, they took it out in 1908. Mm -hmm. But then it was reinstated, mm -hmm. and in 1933, uh, Benjamin Feinberg, for whatever his reason were, took it away again. So we don't no, know why. We they... don't know why. A number of people may wonder, what difference does it make? But for you, it truly had implications. Yeah, because I had to sue. And anyone that would be in this situation today, and, and I know from my attorneys, they can't help them unless there's a business connection. And to me, my father was the business connection. And everything that we did together with Horace put me in a different category of law. I didn't want to hurt that person. He was already not well. I didn't know that he wasn't well, but we were, we were separated anyway because he went into seclusion after he lost the project and everything. And that was already painful, very painful. And then I had to do that and see him in deposition and in court. And, and it broke my heart, but I had to survive. I don't even think he wanted a divorce because he, he didn't. He didn't want a divorce. But I had to do that. And, he was upset, of course he was upset. And so was my daughter. So we were, all of the three of us, in a mess because of not having anything to support us. Otherwise, it would have been done like normal people do. By not being legally married and not having common law marriage in New York, did that create problems for you? When he was uh, really very, very, very sick and he was um, not moving from ALS anymore, I needed permission from my daughter to go visit him, yes. Our daughter. And, and that's another, another stab in the heart because, you know, how could you do that? You're hopeful that the legislature oh, yes. may oh, yes. reconsider this. Oh, yes, because it's not 100 years old yet. If it was 100 years old, we have a problem because then you got to make it new. It's, you know, but now still grandfather, you call it? Yeah. And why is it so important to, to have it have this law back on the books? Because I don't want anyone to have to go through what I went through in, in having to hurt a person that you love. It's very important, very, very important to have a law like that. And there's only 13 states in the union that have that. I'm also hoping even more. And I want 37 other states to follow. There's so many people in this situation today more than ever. 
Why did you decide to do this documentary and, and to share your story? The documentary was not the first idea. The first idea was a book. So I went and I spent a lot of time on working on the book, and then another, and then a screenplay. I think a documentary is you like, you go right to the point that you want to reach. It's much more effective in wanting to make changes. Ida Blard, thank you very much for taking <laughs> the time welcome. to be with thank us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.